think we just need to wait. Okay, we're being recorded. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming um, to this very exciting launch day event of The Reckless Afterlife of Harriet Stoker by Lauren James. Um, so Lauren, why don't you start by just telling us a bit about the book? Yes, so Harriet Stoker is a fantasy novel. It's my first attempt at writing something that isn't sci-fi and it's set around Halloween and it's about a abandoned building full of ghosts. So I'm going full spooky for this panel um, just because I really wanted to do a launch where everyone was in costume and obviously that couldn't happen this year so I'm doing it on my own anyway. <laughs> so in the, it's a bit of a horror, it's also a bit of a romance, I like to call it a horror rom-com and it's all about a new ghost who is a fresher at uni and she explores this abandoned building to take photos and falls and dies immediately in the first chapter and starts learning all about the world of ghosts and all the kind of powers you can have as a ghost and decides very quickly to try and get as much power as possible so she's a bit of a villain and it kind of is about the downfall of her and the uprising in this uh, civilization of ghosts that no humans can see <laughs> And it's excellent. <laughs> I've read it. It's great. <laughs> I think I say this every time, but I think it is genuinely my favourite book of yours so far. <laughs> I do say that every time. <laughs> my my mum and my brother say the same thing. I think because it's like a fun adventure, and there's not like a big science lesson you have to learn while I'm trying to teach you something. It's just like how can I make these characters fight each other to the death <laughs> and keep doing that for 400 pages. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Um, yeah, so if you don't know who I am, hello, I'm Alice Oseman. Um, I'm here to ask questions for Lauren. And also, I had a book out recently. My latest book, Nick and Charlie, is a short story. It came out um, at the start of August. Um, it's a spin-off story from my debut novel, Solitaire, and my graphic novel series, Heartstopper. Um, it's set two years after the current events of Heartstopper, when Nick is just about to go to university, but Charlie, being a year younger, will be left behind. Um, the two boys have to figure out whether they'll, whether they'll be able to go long distance and whether teenage romances really can last forever. So, <laughs> there you go. So, fingers crossed Nick doesn't go to uni with Harriet. <laughs> he could crossed, be the next yeah. ghost in <laughs> Walter Hall. <laughs> exactly. How do you um, think Nick cope as a ghost? <laughs> Oh my god. Immediately oh. getting distracted from our questions that we yeah. found out. <laughs> what I, thought about. <laughs> I just feel like like I as a ghost would not cope at all. I would just be so like stressed and horrified by the whole situation. That's all I can imagine reacting to that scenario. Yeah. Yeah, I, I feel like in real life becoming a ghost would be both really, really boring because you can't do anything uh, fun like read or catch up on the TV shows you've missed and like really scary. <laughs> sad. Um, so just for the people who might have missed earlier when everyone was coming in, you can ask questions. We're going to be doing a Q&A with you lot at the end. Um, so just use the little Q&A function on Zoom to ask your questions. Um, and I believe you can also, oh no, you can't, not on this one. And some of them you can like upvote questions, but you can't on this one. <laughs> um, so we've both been experimenting with other forms of writing. So like, I obviously write graphic novels and you have recently written a novel in the form of blog posts and you are working on an original screenplay. That's cool. Um, so tell us a little bit about your like different projects and how you think that dif those different formats change the way you work. It's really interesting because we both started writing at the same time and we both started with young adult novels and like but since then we've both written a lot and kind of gone off in different directions but both of our experiences I think we found a lot of the same things even within those different genres like graphic novels and um, blog post stories that kind of stuff and I think like you're always focusing on the characters first and how you can tell their story and make the readers feel the emotions that the characters are feeling, whatever the format is. And obviously that's more visual than some formats. Um, and I think for me, one of the things that I found most different is 
I always try to include a lot of twists. It's kind of what I'm getting known for as a writer um, in, a, in a great way, but in a scary way as well, because it means that I now have committed to having lots of twists in my books. Um, and telling twists is a lot easier in some formats than others, I think. So I found I, in um, a novel, you can have kind of the character give you hints in stuff they're avoiding thinking about that's happened to them in the past or stuff they're noticing that's going on, but not necessarily aware of consciously that will then lead into a twist later on but if you're writing in a different format you can't do that as easily so in a blog post, you can't have a character notice something and think about it but not consciously notice it and so you have to find different ways to tell those twists and I think that's really pushed me as a writer and it ended up coming back into my novel writing with Harriet Stoker in that I wrote a few drafts of it and then went away and did an unauthorised fan treatise which is a murder mystery in blog posts and it made me come back and add in this element which hadn't been there of this mysterious narrator telling the story directly to the reader and they're kind of omniscient and they can see the past and the future and they're not telling the reader everything they know and that was an element that was not there at all but it was something that I um, thought about from kind of thinking about how I would do this as a TV show or how I would tell this in a story online. Um, what other ways can you push what you've got in, in, in just the character's head, if that makes sense? Yeah. yeah, it's interesting. Like, I feel like we've both, in the directions that we've gone, we've both really tried to play to our strengths. Like me and you, we're very, I feel like we've always said that we're very different writers. Like you're so good at plot whereas I'm better at characters. Mm. Uh, <laughs> so like the, like the blog post format is so, I feel like that's just so you because it's perfect for that kind of twisty like storytelling. Whereas my like graphic novels, are, which are very dialogue heavy and like more focused on, you know, faces and things like that, that's definitely more like my sort of thing. So it's cool to get to like do more specific things that, play to our own strengths yeah it's interesting um, um, what have you found about telling a story visually that you do differently from if you were going to write it in a novel format because i know you've gone back into nick and charlie and added illustrations did they add another layer to the story from what was there originally i think they do because what one of the things i like the most about graphic novels is getting to tell story and express emotions without using any words like some whole scenes in heartstopper are just completely without dialogue and that's just part of the fun of it like because in a novel you'd have to you know explain how they're feeling basically and in a graphic novel you can just kind of draw it and let the reader feel through the emotions of the drawings um yeah it's it's difficult to explain but it's something it's like the main thing i enjoy about graphic novels so yeah yeah um right so um, the, your new book, Harry Soka, has many LGBTQ plus characters who I love. <laughs> <laughs> um, so tell us a little bit about the LGBTQ plus representation and storylines in Harry Soka and why you decided to include them in this book. One of my favourite things about seeing this book go out into the world and get readers is that everyone has a different favourite character because uh, there's a whole gang of very lovable cinnamon rolls and they're all quite different and uh, everyone has a favourite and I, I'm enjoying seeing who gets a bit of love. Um, so the main LGBTQ storyline is between Felix and his uh, unrequited crush on Casper. So Felix is gay and for decades he's, since he was alive he's had a crush on his um, roommate in the adjoining room in this halls of residence, Casper, who is kind of a very stereotypical rugby bro who um, was always going out drinking when he was alive and just studying art history. And um, he thinks he's like the fun one. And Felix has been pining after him for a very long time. And I really wanted it started out as I really wanted to write that kind of like nerd and jock um, kind of um, rivalry and. Um, like subvert that a bit um and it kind of it grew a lot from there in that immediately I was like well I I can't just stick to that stereotype I need to give these characters a bit more nuance and how can I develop them so they feel like real people and Casper became one of my favorite characters in the book because a lot of 
the storyline is about um, obviously while Harriet is off causing trouble and being a villain and creating actual demons, uh, Casper is facing a lot of demons of his own in terms of he's always seen himself in a certain way and he's always been like very charming around girls and flirting with everyone and actually maybe he's not facing everything about who he really is and his own demon is that fear of kind of accepting himself and uh, when you've got the a whole of eternity to kind of stay in the same body at the same age uh, is there anything really pushing you to change and grow as a person and uh, if after decades something does come along that changes everything that's really really scary so that was kind of the big core focus for me of uh, how can you take this idea of sexuality which we explore a lot in the YA genre and see what it would be like in over if you have a character who is a teenager in 1994 which isn't really that long ago but in terms of the conversation around sexuality it actually is almost a different age and if you've got someone who is a teenager then what are they going to be like if they face a like generation z youtuber uh, who's pansexual like Harriet who comes in and is just like this is just part of who I am our, our generation everybody is gay now um what is that going to be like when they meet and kind of connect so yeah um I'm sure you've been thinking about this a lot because obviously Heartstopper is kind of the same story of Nick discovering his bisexuality what was the focus there for you yeah I I really felt like there were a lot of similarities between your characters and um, Heartstopper um, in a good way like like I just love that dynamic of um, you know kind of the nerd and the jock and I mean this isn't so much Heartstopper but in Harry Stoker that like sort of em enemies to lovers like progression is just one of my absolute faves um, cannot get enough of that <laughs> um, but like in Heartstopper I always knew from the beginning I wanted it to be the story of you know one person who's already very assured and confident about his sexuality and another boy who is, you know, really doesn't have any idea. Um, and that's really interesting when those two people meet and connect and, you know, one person has to go on that journey and the other person has to figure out like how to support them while also not kind of sacrificing, you know, too much of themselves in trying to help someone in a way. Um, yeah, I just love that kind of progression and storyline. So yeah. One of, one of my favourite things about Heartstopper in like the most recent chapters that are going online is that it really is about like how love cannot fix your problems and how you're still going to be the same person even after you fall in love and how like you cannot rescue someone just because you really love them and they're always going to have to face their own struggles and yeah that really felt like resonated for me a lot with Casper and Felix's journey in the book. Yeah, definitely, because I Casper really has to kind of deal with this situation on his own and he faces a lot of things that Felix doesn't even really fully understand. Like, there's a lot of it, I feel like Felix didn't even really fully understand like what Casper was going through. Um, yeah, it's great. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so another thing that there is a lot of in Harry Soka is ghosts. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so it's quite a little bit of a spooky, surreal book, um, you know, so how do you create that kind of tone and mood in the story, um, not just for horror, but in all your books, what is your secret to creating tone? It is something that I really enjoy and I feel like I'm writing a book to get the chance to do those things like you're writing towards the bit where you can really scare the reader and I did the same thing in The Loneliest Girl in the Universe where you've got a girl on a spaceship and it gets scarier and scarier until the point where hopefully the reader can't read it with the lights off at night because they're so scared and I definitely felt that way writing them like I tend to have a lot of scary dreams about my books if I'm going in the right direction so yeah scaring myself and the readers is always the goal with these kind of things um but i think one of the things that really builds the kind of creepiness of a story is the setting and 
the place like when you've got somewhere that feels really claustrophobic and confined uh, and like your characters are trapped then that's really um something that you can convey quite well to the reader and make them feel the same way and i do fall back on that kind of trick up my sleeve quite a lot so i did um in the quiet at the end of the world i have the characters go down and get trapped in a cave and kind of they're in the same way that romy is trapped in this confined spaceship they're trapped under the ground and um, um, in Harriet Stoker, one of the things about these ghosts is that they're not able to leave the building where they died. So they can go up to the walls and if they try and leave, they start to disintegrate and go into atoms in the air. So they, when you um, are in somewhere like a halls of residence, that's quite a big building, but it's still not very far to get away from people that you're trying to avoid who are maybe trying to murder you. Um, so one of the things that really, I hope managed to capture that um, creepy tone was having it feel like there was no escape. And that even like when you might spend years staying away from the enemies, <laughs> uh, at some point they're gonna get you because it is really like there's all eternity here. Um, and there are characters who have been avoiding their enemies for hundreds of years by the time Harriet comes around and stirs up trouble so that was one of my favorite parts of it was getting that creepy tone while also balancing it with like the fun because I wanted it to feel like a comedy and I wanted it to feel like one of those classic tv shows where you've got a group of like weirdos just hanging out like one of my favorites at the minute is what we do in the shadows um which is just about a, like really old vampires who are just idiots and that was kind of the same vibe i was going for i wanted it to be very creepy and also very fun how do you go about building up tone i think it's a similar thing for me like although my books are they're all contemporary so it's not like there are ghosts <laughs> walking around um like it is setting i think just thinking about my books, I have tried to kind of pepper in just little bits of setting kind of throughout. Um, like in I Was Born For This, it's just kind of raining through the whole book. Like it's mostly set in London and it's just rain through the whole thing. And that seems like quite, I mean, not that's not even particularly interesting setting <laughs> rain. <laughs> but what it does is it like, it just brings the whole book together and gives it that sort of visual like element and I don't know yeah I can't explain it but that's kind of I like, love using rain like as a tr it feels like a bit like a cheat because it's so great at getting like emotional classic, that. pathetic fallacy that you learn about at school <laughs> There's a scene uh, in Harriet Stoker where Felix and Casper have a heart to heart on a fire escape in the pouring rain that I pitched in my head from before I ever wrote a single word because it's such a classic rom-com scene uh, it, and it, like it really works like even though you know in your heart that it is a cliche like it still makes you feel things. Yeah. <laughs> um, what like what are your horror recommendations because Harry Stoker is creepy. So are you a horror fan? Because I, I honestly don't know the answer to this question. Do you like proper full on horror? And if you do, what are your recommendations? I love getting scared by a book, but I don't think I watch many horror films. They mm. tend to be like, I like it when it's quite subtle, but if it's actually scary, I'm like, no, I'm not going to fall for this. <laughs> so in films, some of the ones that I really like are Stoker, which you might guess is where Harriet Stoker got her name, um, not uh, Bram Stoker. <laughs> uh, so it's a 2013 film by the director who did The Handmaiden. And it's a very, very creepy, um, subtly horrible story about rich people murdering each other which is one of my favorite things um and i also really like all of shirley jackson's writing so she is um like a 1950s kind of classic ghost storyteller so one of my favorites of hers is we have always lived in the castle which is about a, a girl who is a very unreliable narrator and all of her family is dead and you don't know how they died and she's now living alone in this massive house with her sister when a mysterious cousin comes to visit um so that's a great one 
And then in YA, I also really love Frances Harding's writing. All of her books are great, but uh, she wrote A Skin Full of Shadows a couple of years ago, which is about ghosts. And it's about a girl in the English Civil War who has lots of ghosts living in her head. And one of them is the ghost of a bear. So it's it can't speak, but it can feel emotions. And most of the emotion feels are like fury and rage and like, the desire to tear people apart <laughs> so having that in her head really causes a lot of trouble so that's a really good creepy one as well mm. uh, and there's another one which is for a bit of an older reader the library at mount char uh, which is about kind of a weird library uh, full of psychopath gods basically <laughs> who are being raised to cause as much trouble as possible so that's what like I still think about some of the scenes in that because they are so terrifying what about you do you read or watch much horror I literally am the most wimpy wimp you have ever come across like I cannot deal with horror at all <laughs> like maybe sometimes I can stretch to like a psychological thriller but that's like my limit anything scarier than that I'm just traumatized so <laughs> It's enough. <laughs> I feel bad for putting you through my books now. <laughs> no, your books are okay. They're creepy, but they're not like horrific. And but I feel like books are slightly less scary than movies. I don't know. What do you think? Because you can put them down. Yeah. Like, when you you get too scared and pick them up when it's daylight or there's no like ominous music which is making yeah. it. Yeah. That does that does like a really good job as well. That I think. Uh, as a writer you've got a challenge of how can you beat the scary music <laughs> or the romantic music and I think in the Heartstopper you do that so well with the the falling petals and leaves that show like their emotions like yeah. and it's almost like you've got this swelling music on the page like orchestral music taking them through the story <laughs> oh that's so nice <laughs> Um, so before I ask the next question, just a reminder to everyone that we'll be doing a QA and a in like 15 minutes, so if you have any questions at all, put them in the little Q&A box and we will answer them in a bit. Um, so, apart from horror and creepiness, you also like to explore time and time travel in your books. Um, there's time travel in your Next Together duology. So you've written a book set in post-apocalyptic London and now obviously in the Bound University Hall of Residence from the 90s. Um, so why do you like exploring time and how does it affect your writing process and the books you write in general? I think that when you write any story you want the readers to connect with the characters and feel like they can relate to them so even if it's like a very far future or um, really high fantasy setting you need to find the connection with modern day life and so when I was writing about space one of the things that really stuck out for me immediately was that if the only people you can talk to on earth, are on earth and you're just receiving messages uh, like dispatches then that's almost like making friends on the internet and that was like the thing that I was r referring back to the whole way through was um how can i make this feel like we all feel when we meet someone online and we don't maybe know who they are and then the same thing about writing about um like my dystopian london where there's only about 300 people left and um no one is ever going to be born like a teenager in that position you'd think that like you could never imagine what's that that's like and relate to it but when you it really comes down to it it's all a question of like what am I going to do with my life and what is the point of existence if like in this case if the world is ending but in just in general like we often feel like because of climate change and, and like politics right now that the world is over and there's no point working hard <laughs> um but like how can you find meaning in that situation so um that's always like how I try and focus on it and then but once you've got that common thread you can go off in like crazy directions with the story because the reader has found something in there to connect with so in Harriet Stoker the thing for me that I wanted to talk about was friendship and how these ghosts have been trapped together for decades so they have a, a very tight bond because they're just bored all the time they spend a lot of time hanging out and they can kind of they fall into these like playful banter and play fights that they've done loads of times before because that's all they have to do and if you send a girl in there who 
is not very good at making friends anyway like she's never really found that friendship group she can spend time with at school and then at uni as a fresher she just drifted around in the hundreds of other freshers going to parties and never made any connection that's going to be a really big thing that she feels terrible about if she enters this building and everybody there knows everything about each other and they're the best of friends and they've already got the people they want to spend time with and that's going to be that builds up into a big resentful thing for her and I guess it's similar to my other books again which is that it's just about loneliness like I'm alone in space or I'm alone at the end of the world or I'm alone in a building full of other people like um every reader can relate to that feeling I hope um so that's how you can guide it through a crazy scenario and keep it relevant yeah what about you how do you use time because obviously all your books are set in the present day but yeah. that has changed uh, what the present day is in terms of like when you wrote it yeah that's a really interesting point actually like I have a lot of issues with solitaire and heartstopper because of when they were written and people get so confused about like when they're supposed to be set because solitaire was my first book and I wrote it in 2012 which is ages ago <laughs> <laughs> um, so obviously it was supposed I mean it was supposed to be set in like 2011 um but Heartstopper it w I didn't start writing it till 2016 and but the story of Heartstopper actually takes place before Solitaire but I didn't write Heartstopper as if it was taking place in 2010 so it does confuse things a little bit um just recently actually I put on my author website a timeline of all of my works just because I get the question so much like when is this book supposed to be set um so I always I always write as if I'm in the present and like that does cause issues sometimes well like it has a lot of positives people often ask me like oh aren't you worried about your books dating really quickly or seeming really old and I guess that's a little bit of a worry, but at the same time, there are so many benefits to writing in a way that feels super current and modern and including pop culture references and things like that. I just find it really fun and people enjoy it. And, you know, maybe the book will feel a little bit old in like five or six years time. I think that's okay. Like it's okay for a book to age a little bit and people to read it and think, oh, this was probably written like five years ago. I mean, it was. <laughs> so yeah, it's it's an interesting one, but I don't I don't worry about it too much. So yeah. I agree. I really enjoy writing about like modern culture and referencing social media and how the internet changes the way we talk and all that stuff. And the kind of the cheat I found to actually put it in the books is have it as be kind of like a historical artifact for the characters as well so uh in harriet stoker obviously all these ghosts are from the 90s so all of the things they remember from their life are very nostalgic to harriet um like the x-files and usenet and freddo's being 10p all those kind of things and um, so i can get in that kind of modern culture without the reader being like this is so weird this is set in 2020 and there's not a pandemic like it's kind of set out of time looking back at our culture and I'm trying to do the same thing as well with my uh, murder mystery and blog posts and unauthorized fan treatise where it's kind of framed as this like relic of uh, a few years ago on the internet so you can have all of those very funny memes that um we see and then they go out of date within days sometimes and that act kind of adds to the feeling of this being like a long lost thing <laughs> Yeah. what are you going to do in the future about books set in the present day are you going to try and incorporate the pandemic or anything like that i think i probably will eventually it's so difficult because things at the moment i think are still changing so fast like you know things could be totally different in like a week's time to how they yeah. are this week like do you know what i mean so I don't know I don't think if I was starting writing something right now I would include it but in say in like a year two years time I probably would like because I'm hoping by then things will have kind of calmed down <laughs> we'll have at least more of a sense of like what life is going to be like post coronavirus whereas now like right now we're still very much in it um so everything's just a bit confusing and I wouldn't know how to put it in a book right now so yeah 
True. It is crazy. I started writing a book about climate change in March, so right when lockdown began, and it's set about five years in the future from now. So I was like, I'm going to have to mention the lockdown and pandemic and stuff. So I started doing some research then about the predictions for what that would do for the economy and uh, how we work and how we are working online now and how that's going to change, like how much petrol we consume, which leads into like discussions about climate change. And most of the predictions that I read about and put in the book then are already wrong and it's only been a couple of months so it is really difficult I think and I imagine that a lot of authors at the minute are going through the same question of trying to be like um realistic and convey the real world while also knowing that the life cycle of a book takes like years before it's ever seen and um I can't I don't know how Ali Smith does that where she's like writing books and then they come yeah. out in the season they're set in like it's really scary to me uh, I like to have like a buffer of 30 years into the yes. future <laughs> Um, so speaking about time, um, one of the big things about Harriet Soka is that your teenage characters have been stuck at the age that they are for like, how long, is it like 20 years? It's something like that. Yeah, so just over how, 20 years. <laughs> yeah, it, it's long. <laughs> so like, how did you approach writing their voices? Did you try and stick more with like, a usual teenage voice or were you kind of thinking this is a teenager who has been stuck as a teenager for a very long time like what was what was your process it was it was something I thought about a lot especially because um when you're writing a book for young adults they need to be characters who are teenagers um and really it came down to for me um when you're at uni you're in kind of this space where you don't like it's uh, a few years where you are free to be not a child and not an adult and you can explore yourself and be silly and fun and not have any responsibilities but also become a real person and that's kind of how I wanted it for, to feel because I don't really see that a lot in YA that kind of time between school and uh, adulthood and I think that's missing in what I'm reading as a, a reader I want to read books about that age and when I was at uni I wanted to read books about like roommates living together and that's what um was drew me to the story and so when I was thinking about what their characters would be like um, and knowing that in reality if they were still alive they'd be 40 but in the book they're like 17 um, it was like if you are stuck in a building and all the people around you are stagnant as well and there's nothing you can do you can't learn anything new there's no way to get information in you can't make new friendships and relationships you can't leave and go and get a job like all of those things are the what makes us grown grown-ups and without that they all they can do is kind of cling to their lives that they had when they were still alive and um the only thing they can get is more monstrous they can't get more human and more grown up but they can become less human if they decide to go down that path and so that was what i was thinking about when i was making their characters and some of them go in different directions to that um there are older ghosts in the building as well who are older than 20 years some of them are thousands of years old and they kind of change in different ways after watching many many generations of living humans in this space where this building is um they've kind of evolved to become less human so yeah that was the how i approached it how do you approach writing teenagers as you kind of age out of being a teenager yourself? Because obviously you created Nick and Charlie when, were you the same age as them? Yeah, pretty much. That's like, crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I guess I try to, I mean, firstly, staying aware of like what, how teenagers talk is like so important for contemporary YA particularly. Um, and that's, for me, that's just, trying to be online and kind of just be aware of like how teenagers talk to each other. I, I recently joined TikTok, <laughs> which is literally, it's another world. <laughs> I am, it scares me. It is scary. <laughs> but, I'm too scared like, to face TikTok head on. I like subscribe to some newsletters about TikTok trends, which I study like anthropology. And even with the explanations of like, why these, like generation zoomer tiktokers are looking at house listings on zoopla or <laughs> doing these dances even then i still am like this makes no sense to me 
really interesting. And actually, you know what? TikTok reminds me of the very early days of Tumblr. I think they're very similar. Um, so just like, for me, like being aware of how teenagers talk is such a big part of it. Um, yeah, I don't know. I guess just trying to write in a kind of emotionally honest way and not having them sound, you know, I don't think teenagers sound like immature or anything like that. I don't deliberately try to write in like an immature way or a young way. I just kind of try to write almost like how me and my friends talk to each other now, but with the added awareness of like what the current teenage, you know, lingo is. Oh, lingo is such an old person word. <laughs> I'm so old right now. <laughs> it's like adulting. I've been adulting today. <laughs> um, yeah, so. Um, so like related to that, we've both written books um that feature characters at university so which is quite rare in YA but there's not a lot of books featuring university age characters um do you think we're going to see more of that in YA and added to that what is your vision for like the future of YA it is really interesting because um, we both got published in 2014, which is kind of around the time when YA became really big as a genre and became very mainstream. Um, and so we've, I've like definitely seen it change a lot in that time. And having become into the industry at an age when I was like 19, 20, I was still the target audience for YA. And since then I am now 28 oh, uh, and I've definitely aged out of the target audience. And I look at the YA that's coming out and I'm like, this is not aimed at me. Uh, I cannot read this and judge it as a reader now. I have to judge it as if this is aimed at younger readers. Um, and I think like seeing what is being published it's definitely split into two kind of differences there's like um commercial ya which is kind of the the fantasy like sarah j mass which is aimed at a big age range of readers and is often like a bit more explicit and grown up um, and very fast paced and then you have the younger YA that is aimed at real teenagers like Lucy Powery's books I think are perfect like for if you're trying to buy a book for an actual 12 or 13 year old girl that is the YA you want her to be reading um, and so it is a really weird place for the genre at the minute and I really wish that the new the new adult genre had worked because that would be what I would be reading right now that would be where I would want to be published because it's kind of that older age range like you say university freshers at YA rather than like year 11 YA and um yeah I don't know where it's gonna go uh, I'm very interested to hear your thoughts on this as well yeah I'm really hoping that we see more books that are YA in style but about older characters because I think YA although it's not really a genre like it's such a huge category of fiction I think there is a YA style and there's certain you know things that most YA does really well you know I think YA is great for characters and relationships whereas a lot of adult fiction isn't so much about you know falling in love with certain characters or certain relationships um, a book that I think is very much a good balance of adult and YA is uh, Red, White and Royal Blue, which I think is so YA in style, but it's obviously for adults, like it's a, a marketed towards older older young people <laughs> yeah there's there's sometimes i read a book for adults and i'm like this is written by someone who reads and loves ya you can yeah. tell that they've embraced the diversity and the humor and the natural use of internet <laughs> in yeah. there that and it feels very kind of ya for the next generation um and those are all my favorite books for adults and I think the the romance space especially is so good at talking about stuff like body positivity and sexuality and um, all of those topics which you still don't see very often in adult fiction they're really coming to the forefront in romance so yeah. and maybe that is where all the young adult readers are going <laughs> yeah maybe <laughs> um so I think it's now time to move on to questions which is very exciting um so let me just have a look. Oh, this is a good question. Do you two believe in ghosts? <laughs> you go first. 
I don't believe in ghosts, but my family have a lot of ghost stories. So my nan always tells a story about a, um, a her dad dying and coming back as a ghost to haunt her mum. Um, this is up in Yorkshire many years ago. Um, so there's definitely like belief in my family about ghosts. And um, sometimes it does feel like our old cottage is being haunted. And I know that like there's stories of people who've died there, like sitting by the fire and stuff. Um, so I don't necessarily be, believe in ghosts, but I would love to see one. I think it would be like, first I would write another book about it. <laughs> but I think like the, the psychological implications of seeing a ghost would be very fascinating. Yeah. See, I have never had like any sort of ghost or like spiritual experience. Um, but I, I just, there's so many people who have. Like literally it's... Like, so, so, I can't remember what the exact percentage of it is, but I read the other day that it's, like, a really high proportion of people claim that they have seen a ghost or have had some sort of ghost experience. So, it's just, like, surely if that many people have had that experience... Mm. I'm I'm very scientific like I study yeah. science at uni, so I always look for the scientific explanation and I find it so interesting that when like ghost stories were a big trend in Victorian times that was because that was when gas was first getting installed in people's houses and there were a lot of carbon monoxide leaks which gave them all hallucinations and like they were all then writing ghost stories and yeah. Edgar Allan Poe he's got like a deformity in his face from carbon monoxide poisoning so he was actually hallucinating things that he put in his stories which is so cool to think about um mm -hmm. Yeah, it I, it makes you wonder, like, what other stuff we don't know about that we're kind of like poisoning ourselves with that's changing the way we think that in like a hundred years so we're going to be look back at it and be like, that's what that was about. <laughs> <laughs> oh, scary. Um, so another great question: How much fun is it to write about a main character who is more of a villain than a typical YA relatable protagonist? It was so much fun and I actually immediately went and did it again in an unauthorised fan treatise because I was like I cannot write about a good person I need to write more evil villains because there's just like I love that they don't think about what people think of them so they're not like they're acting because they have a, a motive they have a motivation for something they want to achieve and they're they don't care if it makes them look bad they don't care if people hate them they are only focused on what they want which is so rare to see in a woman like we are all trained to think about how we're portrayed in society and making sure that we look beautiful like all of those things if you've got a villain character you can forget about them and you can see what they are really like and yeah it was really fun would you ever write about a villain i really I'd love to, to see an Ozman villain <laughs> yeah i actually really want to i think it would be really fun i've had this like vague ambition to write some sort of book about like some sort of really famous YouTuber or like a really famous social media star who is like super rich and like really immersed in that world of social media fame and they're just an awful person. <laughs> it will be so fun to write um but we'll see we'll see no problem we talk a lot about writing something together and we always come back to the idea of having like a hero and a villain and yeah. like getting to write those two perspectives and explore how they interact and i would love to see you write someone just really awful and yeah i think we could do something very fun with the villain if we write something together <laughs> great um okay let me have a look at the questions Oh, an excellent question from Sarah. If you were going to write a book together featuring one character each from one of your existing books, who would you choose? Hmm. That's such a hard one. <laughs> a hard one. Who, who would make a good team out of our sets of characters? I would love to have one of the um, singers in I Was Born For This interact with Gotti as a yes. fan girl oh and God. she focuses her attention on the arc and uh, maybe teams up with one of them that would be really cool That's such a good idea <laughs> you know what 
I can so imagine Gotti doing some like really big investigation into the arc and like trying to find out like who like because in in I was born for this you know Jimmy and Rowan and like everyone ships them and thinks it's she could be the main shipper <laughs> or but because the, they're not actually dating she could like find out that they're not actually dating and then like break the news she could be like the investigative journalist yeah, yeah like breaking the internet that would be so good. Oh my god. Okay. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, next question. Um, oh, this is, a, this is a good one. The way the theme of death was handled reminds me a lot of The Good Place. Was that an inspiration? I love The Good Place and it came out a long time after I'd written it so it wasn't an inspiration um, as much as when I was watching it I was like this is everything I was trying to do like looking at the afterlife and seeing how y you can change or not change and that's the big question in The Good Place is like if you die in a certain way can you evolve as a person after that and that's exactly what my ghosts are thinking about as well um so yeah i love that and i love chidi as a character he's very much like felix <laughs> which yeah again i'd already written felix so i wasn't just ripping off chidi but maybe it's something about the afterlife it makes you think about yeah. those kind of stereotypes and questions about morality i love the good place i'm so sad it's over <laughs> Um, okay, uh, so let's find another question. Oh, who would you most like or dislike to be stuck living with for eternity? Real people or personality types? Do you have an answer for this one? <laughs> um, see, I feel like it would be good to be stuck with someone creative because then, like, if you're going to be stuck somewhere for all eternity, it's going to be very boring. So you need someone who's going to be like, right, let's write a musical and perform. Could you, could you create anything though? Because you'd need like some kind of paper or access to a laptop. Like, Maybe. is this possible? Would you, like, I guess a musical, you could kind of remember it in your head, but you yeah. couldn't spend the afterlife writing a novel because you couldn't write it down. Oh my gosh. But I guess you'd want to be around someone creative anyway yeah I, I always thought it would be so cool to like see, meet someone like Jane Austen or Shakespeare mm -hmm. and show them the adaptations of their work that are happening now um like whenever I watch like the Midsummer Night's Dream that came out recently um where they completely mix it up I'm always like Shakespeare would love this I wish he was a ghost that I could just take him to the theatre and show him this um so I feel like someone like that, like someone creative where they're from a different age so you can kind of uh, like learn from each other in how creativity worked in a different time. So yeah. Yeah. that was a really good question. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, let's find another question. Um, okay, so not book related, but how have you been doing in lockdown? Are we living alone? Um, so just a general question, like how are you finding like creating in lockdown? Has it like affected your work or what's been going on? <laughs> it is weird. I think actually it's kind of saved me in a way because um, I started a novel at the start of lockdown and for months that was my main focus every day was getting to the end of the novel before the deadline and then I sent it off and suddenly it was like oh, I'm in lockdown <laughs> like it only occurred to me that I was in the middle of a pandemic after three months or something and I had a bit of a breakdown like what do I do with myself now and luckily I've now got the new edits back <laughs> so I can just go dive straight back into another world but it's it's such a strange time and I think people have processed it in different ways some people are kind of being extra creative and others are just not able to write at all right now how are you finding it yeah it's been okay for me I think obviously I feel like I'm very lucky to for example I don't have any small children who I have to teach <laughs> I feel really bad for people who have suddenly had to take on teaching their children as well as normal childcare. but um so for me it's been quite you know it's been good for my work because I've had a lot of, a lot more time to do certain projects than I thought I'd have um obviously it's you know sad that we had to postpone events and stuff like that but like for me it's been okay creatively so yes 
would you like to see Ollie, who is my small child that I've been taking care of, oh, my dog? <laughs> Come here. Oh my gosh! Oh, you the bandana. <laughs> I got him a little bandana. He's dressed up as well. Oh he's my very God. sleepy, so he's probably going to disappear and go back to sleep. Oh. <laughs> I'm very good in lockdown. I don't know what I'd have done without him. <laughs> well, Lucy says, not a question, but Ollie is super cute. <laughs> yeah. He's very naughty, but very cute. <laughs> okay, let's find another question. Okay, this one's from Charlotte. I saw Professor Brian Cox live last year and he was talking about space time theories that I recognised from The Loneliest Girl in the Universe. Um, as a huge astronomy cosmology nerd, I'd love to learn more about space time. Do you have any recommended resources to learn about it? Oh, that's a good one. Um, resources. So when I was writing it, I was fresh out of a physics degree. So I referred a lot to my coursework and just what I'd learned in modules. I'd just done one, luckily, about space um, that was very useful. I don't think I could write that now, actually, because I had to do a lot of calculations that have since completely gone out of my head. Um, but I'm a big fan of nonfiction and a lot of my inspiration for books comes from nonfiction. So, like I said, at the minute, I'm writing about climate change. So I'm reading a lot of books and learning a lot about economics <laughs> to do that. Um, and it always like kicks off my imagination because uh in fiction like one of the pleasures of reading a book is that you recognize the plot format and the, the tropes they're using and the structure uh, and you can kind of predict where it's going um so it's very easy to read those and not kind of be inspired creatively because that's the idea you want something recognizable whereas in non-fiction i'm putting things in my head that i've never thought of before or come across and um, it really inspires me. So one of the big things that I do to find new nonfiction is um, I listen to a lot of audiobooks through my library and I just go through their nonfiction and see what weird stuff they have that I would never pick up. But because it's in audiobook format, I can listen to it when I'm like doing the chores or walking the dog or something. And um, I find a lot of really cool science stuff out that way. So my recommendation there is to use your library, <laughs> which is what I've been doing even during the pandemic. Um, I've read some great books that seem to be about pirates, but then they end up being about like the economy <laughs> and learning a lot of stuff there that goes in a book or like in my notes to go in a future book. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I, um, another thing that I use a lot is Future Learn, which is a website where you can do online courses for free in and um, that are taught by UK universities. So I've done some amazing ones where you do. Um, you have six weeks and each week they release a video lecture and then a quiz about marine archaeology or Egyptology and you can um, follow along with the other students and learn about something weird that way. That's always very handy if I'm like, I need to know everything there is to know about space. <laughs> I'll go and quickly do a course in it. <laughs> what about you? Where do you usually get your inspiration from? I don't even know. It's just like all over the place. Um, yeah just like reading watching movies watching documentaries just everything like everything i see is inspiration <laughs> potentially documentaries is a good one i don't tend to watch many documentaries where do you watch them oh there, there are a lot they are there are a lot of good ones on netflix i watched oh, i watched such a good documentary like last week um which was the making of frozen 2 oh, that has the second time that's been recommended to me so for good. something it's about good. for creative people yeah yeah it's, well, it's like, about the making of frozen oh 2 God, so good like <laughs> it just follows kind of the whole creative process and it's really not what i imagine like it really is just this kind of small group of key people just like meeting in an office and chatting and like there's the two kind of composers of all the songs who are like performing the songs to all the group and it's just like not what you would expect from Disney like a big corporation it's really like focusing on the creative stuff it's yeah would recommend it made me feel very inspired and also made me want to work <laughs> for Disney <laughs> isn't it like six hours long or something as well yeah it's, it's like a proper chunk of time. yeah 
I, I clearly need to check this out. Laura Wood recommended it to me as well. So that's, <laughs> you wouldn't think that that was one that would be very good, but yeah, clearly it inspires a lot of people. I, I also really like uh, Nina LaCour's podcast. She does an amazing writing podcast where that she's got like a very calm voice and it's got really nice like music in the background. It's very peaceful and she just talks about her writing life. And I always come away from that like I need to go away and write four thousand words immediately. <laughs> That's good. Okay, we have three minutes left. So I think we have time for just one more question. Um, so a question from Alex. Are you able to tell us something about the next books we can expect from you? A good one to end on. <laughs> so I, uh, I'm talking about it nonstop because I'm working on it at the minute, but I'm writing a book about climate change because I think every science fiction author needs to be writing about climate change at the minute. I know there's a pandemic on, so climate change isn't seen in the news very much but it is still very much happening and it is still one of the biggest threats that we face as a community um so i'm writing a thriller about a group of teenagers who are getting fed up with the government negligence around the world and the oil company negligence and they decide to take action through civil disobedience and um yeah change the way the economy and capitalism works <laughs> which sounds not very fun to read but it is really satisfying to read i promise <laughs> but that's out uh, in autumn 2021 so a year from now what about um, you yeah what am i working on so i've just finished work on my next novella uh this winter which is coming out in october um it, like nick and charlie it was released originally in 2015 as an ebook but now we're re-releasing it with some small edits and some illustrations um, in paperback form this winter is a prequel short story to solitaire um, and it also ties into the events of heartstopper so yeah that's exciting um and I'm, when's the next heartstopper volume coming out heartstopper volume four yes that is coming out fingers crossed may next year um that's super close that's exciting yes <laughs> if i can draw <laughs> quickly enough <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, I think we are just about at the end of our time. So thank you so much everyone for coming along. This has been really fun. We've had lots of amazing questions. I'm sorry we didn't get around to all of them. Um, and thank you Lauren for being here and chatting. Um, yes, thank you for helping me celebrate publication day, even when we're all stuck at home <laughs> and dressing up <laughs> and Walker for hosting it. And uh, remember that if you haven't yet bought a book, you can get both of our books through Forbidden Planet, who have helped us arrange this event. Okay, okay. Thank, thank you very you. much, everyone. Bye. Bye. I hope you all have a good evening and enjoy Harriet Stoker. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think we did well there at not spoiling anything. <laughs> She dies in chapter one, so I think we're good there. That doesn't count as a spoiler. <laughs> All right, bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>